Brothers and sisters, it's good to be together today as we celebrate and remember that God is a God of new beginnings. You know, singing He's Got the Whole World in His Hands brought back a little flashback for me. I went to kindergarten at First United Methodist Church in Somerset. If you know me, you know that I can't sing. But anyways, I sang that song as a solo at my kindergarten graduation. Never, never thought I'd be back in front of church trying to sing it. So forgive me. It's a new beginning. So we, we turn our attention now to the end of the scriptures, if you will. But really, the last new beginning from Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 7. Would you hear now the word? Of the Lord. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them, they will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, death will be no more, mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who is seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. Those who conquer will inherit these things, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord God, you have promised to make your dwelling among us. Indeed, you've even promised to be in our midst when we are gathered in your name. Make us wherever we are, whether in this sanctuary or watching at home, make us aware of your presence among us. And Lord, by your presence through the Holy Spirit, so love us, so uplift us, so transform us that we might shape our whole lives around the good news of your Son, Jesus Christ, the one who is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Amen. It's no secret that I love the book of Revelation. While its words and its images are wild and the interpretations of it that have been preached and wrote upon are even wilder, it offers a unique perspective on the whole story of God's redemption. Revelation even lets us see the end of time, which is really not so much an end as it is the beginning of something new. We get a glimpse in Revelation, even in the passage we just read, of the redemption of all things, of a new heaven and a new earth, a reality where suffering and death are no more, where God is dwelling among us. I love Revelation because of how it uses all the images throughout the scriptures to sum up and retell the whole of the scriptural story, proclaiming Jesus as the cosmic king and giving us assurance about the world to come and perspective on the world we currently live in. Though the words of Revelation 21 might be familiar to many Christians, the realities that they talk about, that it speaks about, are utterly new, transformative, and foreign to this world. They are words that change everything. Literally, a new heaven and a new earth. All the old passes away. This is hard for us to even fathom. All of the cosmos, all of the world, all of the things we know, gone and replaced. Everything made new. Revelation's vivid imagery suggests that even the ancients understood what they understood as the most elemental things in the universe. 
that those realities of the world would change as well. Of the water, that the sea would change from its stormy chaos and be no more, and that instead the river of life would flow from the throne of God, growing along its banks the healing for the nations a fire that one day evil and injustice and those who cling to it would be burnt up and that light would no longer come from the burning of stars, but from the very presence of Almighty God. Of earth and air, that there would be both a new heaven and a new earth, and that, yea, they would even meet together and be one. Now, I won't forget about teaching on this passage to my first confirmation class at Wesley and I Methodist Church in Ludlow. We were talking about this passage, we were talking about new creation, and out of the mouths of one of our middle school students, they were trying to explain the passage to one of their classmates, but instead they explained it to me. He said, it's like heaven and earth are coming together and becoming one. I'd never seen it like that before, but it's true. Indeed, the holy city comes down out of heaven from God like a bride adorned for her husband. In the new future, God promises heaven and earth are one. In making all things new, God even promises even to dwell among us. All the people will be his people's. No more will there be divisions that we have created. No more the rebellion against God's perfect and pleasing will and all things that are a part of this reality we know is life. Those things that we don't like, but we've learned to live the best we can with, they will be no more as well. No more tears, no more death, no more suffering, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. Can you imagine a world where all those things have died? Truly, everything would be entirely different. But of all those monumental, beyond fathomable changes that God promises, he promises a whole new earth and heaven. He promises that evil and its effects, including death, will be wiped away for good. But the biggest change of all in Jesus' making all things new, what is it? The most glorious change of all that's promised, according to John Wesley, is the change that takes place in us, in humanity. It is the change that happens in people, in you and I, in humankind. And this glorious change is that God works in us to completely restore the image of God that we are created in. We are changed where sin and all of its power working within us is not only forgiven, but it is completely gone. The constant relationship and union with God that we were created for becomes a reality. And not only that we are part of this new creation, this glorious change within humanity means that we are in a place to continually know and enjoy God and to live in that joy without fail. What a wonderful future God has promised. Yes, these beautiful words and varied images of revelation put life and death and life again in a new perspective for us, a God-revealed perspective that we are meant to embrace and live into. It speaks to us of an amazing assurance that indeed in the midst of life's chaos, now all will be well. In fact, this passage is one of the recommended passages in the United Methodist Book of Worship for services of death and resurrection. So I'll confess that I've chosen this scripture passage to preach on for many a funeral. Its promises in the face of death are stunning, assuring, powerful. It puts death into perspective as a failing, faltering reality that will ultimately die itself. Overcome by the presence and the light of the Lamb of God, the firstborn from the dead. And in doing that, it beckons us to live our lives now with eternal perspective. So this past May, I had the honor of preaching again on Revelation 21 at the graveside service of a clergy colleague and a dear saint who faced death much too early. 
and yet who had lived with such clarity and perspective on life and God's love that sharing about her life seemed to shine the light of eternity back on this life. Many of you knew the Reverend Amy Calder, and her faith inspired many here at Madisonville First United Methodist Church and beyond. It was here where she was a member. And it struck me that what I felt said to let, led to say at her service of death and resurrection, whether you knew Amy or not, what I had to say about this passage then might be the best illustration for what it means to have these scriptures, the reality of God making everything new, but the way you live in perspective. So with her husband Shelley's permission, I want you to hear these words that are from Amy's graveside service, but they're really about all of us letting the realities of Revelation 21 shape your perspective and your living. Will you hear these words? I saw, I saw, I heard. These words are trustworthy and true. I will be their God and they will be my children. In the Bible's final book, in the next, the final chapter, we hear these words. John, the words writers, has been given grace to see the truth and to invite the whole world to live by the truth of God's ultimate triumph and commitment to humanity and Jesus Christ. And as I heard the family and others reflect on Amy's life, I reflect that like John the Revelator, Amy was a person who saw, who heard, who knew the truth as it was in God. And in seeing the truth, she lived by it. And she invited others to live by it as well. She saw that there was going to be a new heaven and a new earth, and she invited you to be there with her, with her words and with her actions. She saw that the home of God was among mortals, and she started each day with hours spent in the presence of God. She saw that the words of God were indeed trustworthy and true, and she read, and she studied, and she taught, and she preached the scriptures. She let the trustworthy and true words of the scriptures form her imagination and her whole way of living. She saw that while the day is coming when mourning and crying and pain would be no more, that mourning and crying and pain are present realities now. And if there was something real going on in someone's life, she cared for them, she cried with them, she stayed with them. She saw that she was God's child and how God deeply cared for her, and in response, she deeply cared about She cared deeply and vocationally for her own children. She saw that God was making all things new in Jesus Christ. And in response, she lived to help make people new, championing for others what she had experienced in Christ. And in life and in death, she put herself in God's hands. She saw as she dealt with that disease that led to her death, that one day death would be no more. And she embraced that resurrection hope, that everlasting life that she found in Jesus Christ. And wherever she was in life and in death, she put herself in God's hands. She saw that those who conquer will inherit these things. And she sees now, not from as far as we do, but face to face with the Lamb of God. That indeed the Lord is her God and she is the child. And we gave thanks there in that cemetery for those who see and share with us this vision. We give thanks for Amy, for she saw a new heaven and a new earth, and she helped many to see it as a daughter, a mother, a wife, a teacher, a missionary, a pastor. And we give thanks that we can see the vision as well, here in this time and this place, because of her witness. We give thanks that, like Mary Magdalene, we may gather in a cemetery to mourn the dead, but we can see and experience and encounter that Jesus really and truly is alive. Amen. Yes, Revelation, brothers and sisters, gives us a vision of what is to be. And it can and it should and it must shape how we live here and now. It did as I shared in Amy's life and it does in so many of your lives as I see you living faithfully. It is cosmic redemption promised for the future And in it, we find our redeeming now. Jesus promises that he is making all things new. The whole world will get a new beginning, and we can start living into it 
here and now. Yes, these words, the words of the scripture are trustworthy. They are true. You can write them down. You can live by them. You can shape your life around them. Don't wait for some preacher like me to dredge these words up at your funeral. Live by them now. Bend your life around the reality of God's ultimate triumph, of the fact that God is going to recreate all things in you too. Bend your life around God's defeat of sin and death. Live like death is defeated because it is. Live like eternity matters because it does. Live like God's presence is all around us because it is. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. The very fundamental elements of the cosmos and the world as we know it will be changed, transformed. But the stilling of the sea's chaos, or the fire's destructive nature, or the matter of earth's dirt, or heaven's air, those are not the most glorious transformation that's slated to happen. No, it is the transformation of human beings, of you, of me, of our neighbors, of our enemies. It is the power of God to make our broken, sinful, self-interested hearts transform them into people, the souls that are whole and holy and loving, people who live in the joy of God's continual presence always. And this glorious transformation, it can happen now. Just ask God. Just ask. Let us pray. Lord, In the midst of life, we are in the midst of death, but we already know that we are also in the light of eternity. Forgive us, we pray, Lord, for when our vision has been too short, our concerns too shallow. Take us deeper still, take us higher still, we pray, into the goodness of your love and mercy. Show us the vision of all things new. And give, is, give us out of it a new beginning where we live our lives completely and wonderfully, faithfully to you. Come, Lord Jesus, make us new. Amen. And brothers and sisters, I invite you as we sing the hymn of invitation today to be moved by the words of the hymn. You see, we indeed are marching, moving toward Zion. We are being moved towards the vision of God's kingdom and God's wholeness. This is what Zion is. It's the, pl- pl- it's the idea of the place and promise of God's presence, of God's wholeness. We are on the way there together, church. We're on the way there now. And as we live into God's promises that all things shall be made new. So come, we that love the Lord. Let us let our joys be known. Let's stand together and sing.